What if the greatest tragedy of your life was just covered up? I have never seen any anything like that before or after. This is the story of the worst marine on marine friendly fire in modern history. A story kept from the public. It's like, what did y'all have to hide? Listen to NPR's embedded podcast in its latest series, Taking Cover. As you drive through here, you may not even know that a fire had happened here. You'd assume that this was just open land. A year after the most destructive wildfire in Colorado's history, I drove through the Sagamore neighborhood in the town of Superior. This subdivision was leveled by the wildfire that tore through Superior, Louisville, and other parts of Boulder County in December 2021. Wildfires are common in Colorado, but the Marshall Fire was the worst this state has seen. It destroyed more than 1,000 buildings. Most of those were people's homes. These communities have been slowly rebuilding. But as I drove through the neighborhood, surrounded by a hum of construction noise, it was obvious that even after a year, there was still a long way to go. To the left, there's like spray painted in the snow the outline of, I think, where a home would be. At this point, a year later, it's just crazy that people are like, some people are rebuilt, some people are rebuilding, some people are, it's just an empty lot. There's been a lot of news coverage about the Marshall Fire. We heard about the extent of the damage, the challenges of rebuilding, but there are so many personal stories that most of us haven't heard about what people in these communities saw and experienced that day and how they're feeling now. This is My Story So Far, the storytelling podcast that brings you voices from the plains, the peaks, the valleys, and the hidden corners of Colorado. I'm your host, Luis Antonio Perez. This is the first of two episodes we're dedicating to stories from people impacted by the Marshall Fire. In today's episode, you'll hear from people who ran towards the flames that day. And you'll learn how a horse and a mouse gave people courage and helped them face their pain. Testing, testing, one, two. Oh, wow, the microphone works. Hello, everyone, welcome. On an evening in January, a little over a year after the fire, we gathered with this community at the Louisville Underground, a small venue underneath a restaurant in downtown Louisville. It has a speakeasy vibe because you have to walk through an arcade to find it. Most of the room was filled with storytellers, their friends, family members, neighbors, and other people from the community who'd come to listen. I was grateful to everyone there and eager to let them take the mic. I think it's important to acknowledge that almost every single person in this room has been directly impacted by the Marshall Fire. When we were looking for people who would be interested in sharing their stories, I heard about Megan Rickle, a local rodeo queen who had done some pretty impressive things that day. My name is Megan, and uh, this is an incredible story of the right time, the right place, and the right incredibly heroic and generous group of strangers. My dad built his dream house at the top of Spanish Hills on Davidson Mesa. And he built for my mom and my sister and I our dream barn for our two beloved horses. I uh, half joke with my husband that my horse Caesar is the first love of my life. (laughs) And uh, that still stays pretty true. (laughs) Uh, I remember when I first met Caesar. He was two years old, and he was 21 at the time of the fire last year. I remember where I was that day because we were supposed to be getting more hay for them because while my parents had moved from that house into a smaller home, the horses stayed in their dream home. I was actually at one of our restaurants. Uh, My husband and I are small business owners, and that's when I got the call from my mom. She said... There's a big fire. The horses are in trouble. Please help. And then she hung up. 
that's the briefest phone call I've ever had with my mother, <laughs> which should have been the first indicator. <laughs> As I was driving from Denver, I didn't think much of it. I was staying pretty calm. And then when I turned the curve on US 36, usually that beautiful backdrop that we all call home, those lovely mountains, they were hidden behind an opaque wall of black smoke. And I was the only one crazy enough that was driving into the fire. <laughs> I got into our neighborhood right before emergency vehicles had come in, closed it off. And when I navigated my way around the maze of roads, I came around the corner and I saw my parents were there and they had the trailer attached because we were going to get hay that day. I kept going up the hill. I got about halfway up and then I realized that there were flames on all three sides of me and the only way out was back behind me. Feeling defeated, I turned around and parked. My dad said, I don't know what we're waiting for, but we're here to wait. I'm not going to leave them. We waited and we waited as the flames grew closer and the ash rained harder on the cars. And we're still waiting and this white trailer comes cutting through the gray smoke and it has a big sheriff's badge on it. And they stopped and spoke to my parents and they said, we're with the mounted search and rescue team. They were there to save horses. And my mom, ever the cheerleader goes, my daughter Megan is an incredible equestrian and she's in the car in front of us. Would you like some help? <laughs> And they said, yes, please. So I hopped out of the truck and hopped in the cab with these incredibly kind, heroic volunteers. We were on our way to the first two horses that had been spotted in the neighborhood. In the back of my mind, every time we came across any of them, I'm really hoping ours are among them. We get to the first two. Nicole and I get out, we get them, we get them loaded. And then we take them back to where we left my parents. Loaded them up, went away to the next six horses this time. And as we're trying to work through the logistical issues, such as not having enough halters or lead ropes, and are we really going to have to do three runs? And right as we're thinking all these things, this big other white trailer from Blue Cloud Farms, <laughs> a local training facility, just showed up. This incredibly brave trainer just decided to go there at no one's request or anything. So we head up, we get the next six. They're scattered everywhere. Fire and the wind was wicked. And as the fire was spreading from house to house, to garage, to patio, the pops and explosions are further complicating the chaotic environment that the horses are dealing with. And when we finally get them all gathered, we go back to our safety point. Now we're feeling pretty confident. We're a pretty good little team, the three of us. So once we get them in, Bruce, he turns to me and he says, all right, Megan, it's time for your two now. So we get back in the car. We're feeling some confidence as a team. But that would wear off pretty quickly. <laughs> so when we came around the bend, it was a curve in the road that I had so mindlessly taken thousands of times before. I mean, I memorized that land. And the landscape in front of me was unrecognizable. These homes, the dreams that built them, the memories that were housed within them, they had all been reduced to crumpled steel and ash. And it was heartbreaking. When we were getting ready to head up, the firefighter knocked on our window and he said, you know exactly where these horses are. You know exactly where they are. And Bruce said, yes, sir, we do. And then he says, well, I'm going to send a couple of sheriff's deputies up behind you. And also, you need to understand that you're proceeding at your own caution. There's one way in and one way out. And if you can't get to us, we can't promise we can get to you. <laughs> so he said, yes, we understand. And as the window cracked shut, I breathed the next fear into existence. And I said, well, what if they're not there? We've been asking every single firefighter possible to go and open gates for them. And 
Bruce looked at me in the rear view mirror and he said, well, that's just a risk we're going to have to take. <laughs> so we started our ascent up the hill because you see my parents lived up the hill and all the way down a mile long cul-de-sac. <laughs> so we started that ascent and as we went up in the structures, the homes were burning. The heat from the flames was so strong that it was as if the steel and the glass between me and that fire weren't even there. It was a very surreal experience. And as we were, came to the top of the hill, I realized none of my neighbor's houses were there anymore. And I wasn't really sure if anything would be up there at all. So when we got to the end of the cul-de-sac, that drive felt a lot longer this time than it ever had before. I noticed that our neighbor's house was in flames, but our beloved barn was engulfed in flames. As soon as the axles on that truck stopped, I was out running. Now the thing is, because we backed up to open space, we always let our horses roam around. They weren't locked in the barn, thankfully. Otherwise, this would be a different story. So I was really hoping I'd know where they were. And so as I ran to the back and I approached the arena, <laughs> I looked to the left and through the smoke, there's this big black figure and there they are, <laughs> shoulder to shoulder and hip to hip. They're standing at the closest point to our home, to our kitchen windows. And I realized that they were waiting for us to come and save them or they were prepared to leave the world with each other. And I shouted, Caesar! And he craned his beautiful long neck back between the two of them. His white star that usually sits right between his eyes was all black. They had been sitting in ash and smoke for so long. And I yelled, they're here, they're here. And Nicole and I are getting the gate open and our two brave sheriff's deputies that were behind us running down the, the driveway, and one of them shouts, hey guys, those flames are gonna be on that house in no time. And I, I was like, that's all we need, just 30 seconds a minute. They're right here. So we got them, and the relief was incredible, but there was no time for relief at the moment. So then when we're running them back down the narrow driveway that separates the barn from the house, the wind starts to pick up again and shift. And I can feel that flame again, but this time in my nostrils and in my whole being. <laughs> when we get to the end of the driveway where the trailer is, there was so much structure that was actively burning that we were putting out little fires inside the, the trailer as well as trying to load horses. <laughs> but we got them in and we used the wind to our advantage, swung those doors shut, and as we were taking off, I took one, what I thought would be surely the last look at my parents' house standing there. And when we got to the bottom of that hill and we got to that church parking lot back and safe, my mom almost knocked the wind out of me with her hug. <laughs> she had tears streaming down her face. She said, Megan, I thought I sent you to die. And I hugged my dad. And I said, Dad, I'm so sorry, but I don't think your dream house is there anymore. And he, he said, oh, Megan, you brought out everything that counts. Now, it's really hard to find a silver lining in something so tragic and devastating like the Marshall Fire, especially with the timing of it, riding on the tail end of the pandemic, during which so much distance had been placed physically and emotionally between us and our families and our neighbors and our communities. And over this past year of rebuilding and finding a new normal and this incredible experience where these strangers and these brave servicemen and women came together amid a time of chaos and heartbreak, it's really restored and renewed that sense of community. Thank you very much for listening.
After we heard Megan's story, I had to point out where the tissues were in the room for all of us. We were amazed by what she was able to do that day. After the break, we'll bring you two more stories. First, we'll hear about the Marshall Fire from a first responder's perspective and how he handled an unexpected challenge on a day full of unpredictability. Hi, I'm Emily Williams. I'm one of the producers who work behind the scenes to help bring you my story so far. Our team makes this show because we want listeners to hear these stories. First person, unfiltered, live storytelling. Coloradans sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. And we want to spread the word. So could you help us out? If you know someone who might like this podcast, please take a minute and share it with them. If you know two people, even better. Thanks for listening, sharing, and helping more people discover my story so far. When we started organizing this Marshall Fire storytelling event, we knew we wanted to hear from a first responder. What was it like to be on the front lines fighting this fire? In preparation for this event, I spoke with the local nonprofit Mental Health Partners. They told me that creating an opportunity for the community to share stories with each other was a good idea, but to keep in mind that people are still hurting. Anniversaries of tragic events have a tendency to be emotional low points for most folks. And that this was especially true for first responders. We were mindful of mental health partners' advice when we reached out to Mountain View Fire Rescue, the main department in charge of battling the fire that day. That's how we met Division Fire Chief Paul Johnson. As a first responder, he had to look at this overwhelming situation and calmly find solutions. Paul had a whole day's worth of stories he could have told. So he decided to focus his story on how that day started for him. Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm a division chief of EMS. Uh, for Mountain View Fire, and I was one of the first responders on that day. There I am at work. It's December 30th. I'd been out the whole Christmas vacation, and this was the one day that I decided to go to work, thinking it'll be nice and quiet. I'd get some work done. And I'm turning on the radio, and I'm kind of listening, and I hear uh, units being dispatched. A little bit later, I hear the fire start down off of uh, Highway 93, that's in our district. And almost immediately, you start to hear radio traffic that just kind of makes your hair stand up on the back of your neck. And so I get my truck and I start driving. I'll never forget making that turn uh, off of 95th onto Dillon. And, you know, I could see the smoke, but when I made that turn and now all of a sudden I'm driving straight at it, I mean, that smoke cloud was huge and it was black. Black's not a great smoke color you want to see. <laughs> And I pulled up to that Sagamore neighborhood, and it was on fire. I can't see anything. And I open the window. I can hear the fire, and I can feel the fire. And I'm thinking, I'm in a dangerous spot. So I turn around, and I start driving out. I had to inch my way out. Couldn't see the front of my car. All I could think was I need to get up high so I can see where the fire's at. I need to get a better picture of what's going on. And I drive up onto the ridge, and I start, you know, looking back down into into the original town superior and I can't see any fire, which I'm thinking to myself, like, this is pretty incredible. Like there's so much fire there and I can't see it. Just smoke and ash and soot and wind. And I've never experienced anything like that in my life. So I start, you know, working the fire and we're, we're doing everything we can. I become division Zulu, which is the South side of the fire. So now I'm responsible for the whole Southern edge and, and I'm busy and working on the fire and I get this phone call and I hear, hey, a Vista hospital says they need to evacuate. And I'm like, man, no way. Like, 
now in the midst of this fire, like uh, that's, that's a bad idea. Like that is an easily defendable building. Like I can send some resources over there and, and, and we can handle this. So I hang up five minutes later, phone rings again. Hey, Chris is at a Vista. He says they need to evacuate. They're being impacted by smoke so heavily smoke and debris and flame, you know, that they need to evacuate. And I have this adage that I've always lived by and I got it out of a leadership book and it's always trust the person on the ground. Right? So my instinct was no, but I'm thinking in my head, man, I know Chris. And if he's there and he's saying they need to evacuate, like we need to evacuate. So I'm like, okay, I guess we're evacuating an entire hospital in the middle of the biggest fire that I've ever been involved in. And, and it's a mind switch. And so I, you know, I'm like, like, holy cow, like we're going to need a lot of resources. So I call my friend, Mark, who's a division chief of EMS like me with a neighboring agency. And I say, Hey Mark, I really need some help. And he's like, Oh, I'm in like, where do you want me? And I said, I need you to go to a Vista and I need you to manage the evacuation. And so Mark goes over there and he starts in on the evacuation there's so much soot and smoke and ash getting inside that hospital. And, you know, I'm checking in with him and I'm saying, Mark, what's going on? And he's like, we're evacuating the neonatal ICU, the little tiny babies. And he's like, and I'm, and I'm setting up resources to protect the hospital in case, you know, a window gets broken out or, I mean, I, things I didn't think about at the time, but you got a whole hospital full of oxygen, right? Highly flammable. One broken window, you know, and I'm like, uh, and they're seeing flames out of the ICU window. Everything's starting to catch on fire around. And I don't know if you know Avista, but there's only one way in and one way out. And so our next problem becomes, how do we protect all of these ambulances that we've called? How do we protect the access and egress? So that becomes an immediate firefighting priority for us. After about two hours, we managed to get everybody out of there. And I walked through with uh, Chris, the emergency manager guy, and we were the last ones out of the hospital. Um, closed down the hospital. We evacuated roughly 51 people. We sent 21 home in their own cars. We evacuated about 30 people uh, via ambulance, including the NICU and the ICU. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. And that was just how Paul's day started. He still had hours ahead of him responding to the Marshall Fire. When this community came together to share their stories, I witnessed some special moments of connection. But one really stood out. After Paul told his story, a married couple, Mike and Jesse De La Plaine, were up next. They were there with their two young daughters, who were sitting in the front row. First of all, I just want to thank you, Paul, for everything you did that day and every day. Mike and Jesse realized that they knew Paul. He actually played a very important role in their daughter's life. It's a happy coincidence, but our family has actually come across Paul once before. Um, our daughter was born extremely fast at home before we were ready, and we were alone, and, and uh, Paul was the first responder to be there uh, after I called 911, and I, I, I didn't know what was up or down. I was rattled, and... <laughs> He was, other than my wife, he was the first one to hold my little girl. And by all accounts, from what I heard, he, he, he held her all the way in the ambulance ride and barely wanted to let her go when they got to the hospital. So thank you, Paul. Just that little story was great. But Mike and Jesse had a lot more to share with us. And they took turns to tell their story. It's about discovery and also family and resilience. So our story starts about eight years ago when our youngest, little Tuli, um, was about a year old. Um, you know, that perfect age, she was just starting to get mobile but couldn't get into too much trouble. And our older daughter, Neva, was about four years old, just a beautiful age. And I was at home with the girls, uh, getting some chores done, and I hear the the buzzer on the, the laundry, and I turn to Neva and say, can you watch your little sister for a, just a second? I'm going to run down and do the laundry. She says, oh, yes, Mommy, I'll watch her. 
So I race down into the basement and I throw the clothes from the washer to the dryer and I race back up, you know, thinking, you know, how fast I was. And I take a look at little Thule and there's something in her mouth that she's chewing on. And there's a little tail hanging out of her mouth. And I scream and she, it, it flies out of her mouth, falls to the ground. And I, I blink for a moment, collect myself, look down and it's a mouse. It's a mouse. She was chewing on the face of a dead mouse. <laughs> and I turned to Neva, and I was like, Neva, I thought you were watching your sister. And she's like, I was watching her. She was, I was watching her chew on this cute little mouse. <laughs> So I, I'm panicked. I'm like, I, I called poison control. I, you know, what if this mouse was poisoned? I'm wiping her mouth out with a washcloth. I, I call the doctor. I say, what should I do? And she says, well, come on in. We'll check her out and bring the mouse to. So I put the mouse, <laughs> scoop up the mouse and put it in a bag and uh, scoop up my girls and bring them to the doctor. And she checks out, you know, Thule, and, and she says, I, you know, I, she, she looks okay, but let's, let's check out this mouse. So next thing you know, we're all gathered around the exam table, and there's a little mouse on the table, and, you know, the doctor's poking it and prodding it, and she looks up and says, don't worry, my dad was a veterinarian. <laughs> um, and she says, you know, the mouse looks okay, it doesn't look injured or diseased or anything. Um, but tell you what, you know, head on home, you know, keep an eye on your daughter for the next couple of weeks. Keep the mouse, like put it in a couple bags, put it in the freezer. And like, just in case she gets sick, you know, we could always pull it back out and test it or something. She intended for it to be just two weeks. <laughs> well, the mouse stayed there for a little longer than that, drifted to the bottom of the freezer. Um, but not forgotten about, I mean, the girl's love the mouse story. They, you know, over the next <laughs> number of years, always begging to hear the mouse story. Tell us the mouse story. And we do. But of course, whenever we tell the mouse story, then it always ends with, you know, we want to see the mouse. We want to see the mouse. And at that point, you know, my husband and I look at each other and like, oh gosh, that feeling of dread. Like, we don't want to dredge this mouse up from the bottom of the freezer. And you don't know what kind of state it's in and so we kind of we deflect and we we put it off and we say you know not not this time oh maybe maybe next time oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And another time so fast forward to Wednesday December 29th 2021 the day before the fire and it's winter break we're getting the girls packed up they're gonna go spend the night with grandma and we're getting ready to get them out the door for their sleepover and, you know, Thule comes marching over to us, puts her foot down and says, I want to see the mouse. You guys always say you're going to show it to us and you never do. And I want to see it. Enough is enough. So we nod and we say, it's time to make a deal. We're getting ready to go over to grandma's. You got to get out the door. But when you come home tomorrow, I promise you, we will pull that mouse out and we will look at it. But the next day was the Marshall Fire, and it destroyed our house, burned down completely. And with it, that chance, and all those chances, all the things, the, all the things you say you're going to you know, put off till tomorrow when you should have just done it today. When I told little Thule that our house was gone, that we had lost everything, the, the first thing she said to me, she looked up at me with teary eyes, and she said, Daddy, I've waited my entire life to see that mouse, and now I'm never going to have a chance to see it. And she wasn't accusing, she wasn't angry at me, she was just, she was really, really profoundly sad. I, a little bit after that, I, I saw in an article somewhere, um, it, they, it was about loss, and it said, your home and your belongings, they tell the story of who you are, of where you've been, of who you love. And when you lose those things, sometimes it, 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 you have a tendency to feel like you've lost a part of yourself. You've lost a part of your story. And that's how, in that moment with her, that's how I felt. I, I felt completely lost. I felt... I was so overwhelmed, I was heartbroken. 
all I wanted to do was find something for you guys, for both, for both my daughters, something. I wanted to salvage something, something of meaning to you that would bring you joy. We had a, a, a group of volunteers come and help us sift through the ashes. Uh, they were wonderful. They were very kind. They were respectful. They would bring every little fragment, every little piece of whatever, and we, we huddled around on the edge, and they, they would bring it to us, and we would huddle around it and look at it, and we would try to identify it. It was actually kind of fun to try to pick out what this was. It brought us a little bit of closure. But at the end of the day, these were things that resembled our things. They were not our things. These were blackened, mangled shells of our things. And so we weren't really satisfied. I still was holding out hope that we would find something. And so I was out there every day that we were doing the debris removal. And one of these days, I happened to be out there with my daughter, Neva. And the guy had the front end loader, and he was cleaning up our, our garage. And he had our freezer, and he was lifting it. And this, the freezer was blackened and charred and all mangled. And he lifted this thing way up high so that he could, he could swing it out over all the, the debris and, and put it in the dumpster. And as he was doing that, this freezer just came apart. It cracked like an egg, and everything inside of it came splashing down onto the ground. And I was standing there looking at this in horror because it was, it was all rotten. And it became clear that everything inside of this freezer had not burned. You could still read the labels on freezer bags. And I'm standing there looking at this thing. The smell of it will probably haunt my dreams forever. And, I, and I'm just horrified. And I feel this little poke at my side. And there's Neva. And Neva's always looking out for her little sister. And she tells me, Dad, there's Tuli's mouse. And, I, and I, I said, what? And she said, right there on top. That's Tuli's mouse. And I said, are, are you sure? Well, of course she was sure. I should know better than to second-guess Neva's memory. She doesn't forget a thing. She was only four years old at the time, but she, and she told me, Mommy put it into two Ziploc bags, she put it into a green bag, and then she wrapped it in a, in a, a purple rubber band. So I ran over there, and I look in this pile. Yeah, there's a little green bag with a purple rubber band on it. So I grab it. But I'm terrified of what's inside this thing. It's been sitting in a pile of rotten food for months at this point. I don't know, I don't know what I might find if I open this bag up. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know when to deal with it. So I stash it underneath a bush um, with some of the other little fragments of things that we had saved. Well, the moment came a little while later. There was another day where we were, the end of debris cleanup, we were getting ready to take out the rest of the uh, trees that had been damaged or destroyed in the fire. This was maybe one of the more traumatic days of, of any of the debris cleanup. Um, our, our backyard was kind of our little haven, and, it, and we loved spending time out there, and these trees were a big part of that, and Thule was hugging them and saying goodbye. These trees had names. They were like family members. They were... They were really special and important, and Thule was inconsolable, and I didn't know what to say to help you, and I, and, I, and I look over, and I see this little green bag sitting there under the bush, and I think, if there was a time to do it, it's now. So I grab little Thule, and I say, hey, I want, I want you to open something. I have something for you, and you were like, what is it? And we go over there, and I have no idea what I'm going to find inside this bag, but I take out my pocket knife, and we slit open the outer bag and I peel it back a little bit, and Thule and me, our heads together, sort of peer into this little bag. And the first thing we see is a tail and a little paw. And she turns to me, her eyes, as wide as they could be, and a smile from ear to ear, and she instantly knows what this is. And she grabs it, and she rips it open, and there is, in a zip in double bag, a little mouse, perfectly preserved. It looks like this mouse had been chewed on yesterday. It was, it was perfect. And she took this mouse and she held it above her in triumph and she ran around to every person that was there. She showed everybody. She told everybody the story. 
And of all the things that I thought that we were going to recover from this fire, this was the most unexpected thing I could imagine ending up with as our family's, you know, brand new heirloom moving forward. Well, and I, and I think, too, you know, this little mouse, I mean, it's it's kind of symbolic in a way of, like, our journey as well. Like, it's resilience, and it's, um, you know, the, the healing journey that we've been through. I, I, I think, you know, if this little mouse survived and made it through, then we can, too. And I have to tell you, because I know you're all wondering, yes, once again, that mouse is back in our freezer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse and Mike, for sharing that amazing story. I saw people experience a range of emotions that night in Louisville. Some tears, more laughter than I could have expected, and the kind of special moments of connection that happen when people who've had the same experience share their stories with each other. Thank you to our storytellers, Megan, Paul, Mike, and Jesse. Thanks to Jen Cowish at Superior Rising, Raina Pomeroy at Marshall Together, and Cheryl Gordon with Unincorporated Boulder County for helping us connect with storytellers. Thanks also to Marshall Rock and Mental Health Partners for coming to our event in Louisville to share what they've been doing to help this community. And thanks to the Louisville Underground for hosting this event. Next time, you'll hear more stories about the Marshall Fire, from people reflecting on how their lives look different one year later, and how it's changed their perspective on life. My Story So Far is a show that collects first-person stories from hidden communities across Colorado. If your community has stories to share, let us know. Find us at cpr.org slash community audio. This show is produced by me and Emily Williams. Our editor is Joe Erickson. You can find a list of everyone who works on this podcast in the show notes. For Colorado Public Radio, I'm Luis Antonio Perez. Hi, my name's Emily Williams. I'm a producer on My Story So Far and part of a big team that helps make the podcast. A lot of the stories you hear in this show are people sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. If you want more people to hear this unique podcast built around first-person stories from communities around Colorado, you can help us out right now. Please rate the show on your favorite podcast app or write a review. It helps other people discover my story so far. Thanks for listening and supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.